Good day. My name is John Bindernagel, a professional wildlife biologist who's been studying the Sasquatch <clears throat> as an unfolding discovery over many years. And I would like to um, consider the Sasquatch in terms of philosophy of science. Now, I know that sounds pretty dry, perhaps pretty boring to, to many people, but Philosophy of science, as I've come to understand it, <clears throat> can be quite exciting because it does uh, address unfolding discoveries, discoveries in general, and especially when uh, some discoveries are not unfolding maybe as quickly as we might anticipate they would. And of course, the, the discovery of the Sasquatch is indeed such a discovery. Uh, perhaps I can explain as, as we work through the work of uh, philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn, who basically outlined how he perceives perceived a, a discovery to unfold. He begins in the quote which I used. I, I, I used I used his, his material um, in the epigraph of, of my second book because it was such such a nice encapsulation of the discovery process. Okay, he writes: <clears throat> If a paradigm is ever to triumph, it must gain some first supporters, men, well, men and women. He was writing in the 1970s, men and women who will develop it to the point where hard-headed arguments can be produced and multiplied. Well, let's start with the term paradigm <clears throat> because what we are proposing here is a new paradigm for the Sasquatch and that of course, well not of course, and that is that the Sasquatch is an existing North American mammal. <clears throat> and of course, the new paradigm I think, of course, the new paradigm is re must replace the old paradigm. Okay, so let's that's fine. Um, so we continue. And even those arguments, when they come, are not initially decisive. Okay, let's jump on that word initially because. One may have been so convinced by the evidence supporting the new paradigm that they would be accepted almost initially, that would be unrealistic. <clears throat> However, Kuhn writes, because scientists are reasonable men and women, one or another argument will ultimately persuade many of them. So we are working towards ultimately here. He makes a good point, but there is no single argument that can or should persuade them all. Now, unfortunate, well, fortunately or unfortunately, a single argument keeps being raised as an attempt to persuade them all, and that, of course, is the Patterson-Gimlin film, a, a, a great piece of visual evidence that is very convincing to many people. The problem with that piece of evidence is that it has been treated as the centerpiece, excuse me, as the centerpiece of evidence. And the problem with that is that if that centerpiece of evidence supporting the new paradigm can be debunked, dismissed, shown to be a hoax, then by implication, the existence of the Sasquatch as an existing mammal has been debunked or dismissed. So with due respect to my colleague and collaborator Bob Gimlin and Roger Patterson and those who support it, I suggest that that piece of evidence maybe be held aside a little more than it has been and that we look at other forms of evidence such as track evidence. Um, eyewitness drawings, <clears throat> published historical accounts. There's, there is, in fact, a great deal of other vocalizations. Anyway, 
Okay, Kuhn goes on. Rather than a single group conversion, what occurs is an, in an increasing shift in the distribution of professional allegiances. This is a little bit obscure. I think he's telling us here that rather than expecting a whole scientific discipline, such as my colleagues in, in, in wildlife biology, or such as mammalogists, or physical anthropologists, to suddenly say, oh, gee, we accept the existence of this upright, uh, hair-covered, great ape or human, whatever it is, th there may be a gradual shift, an increasing shift. Okay, nevertheless, if they are competent, uh, they being, I think, he's, in, he's referring to we proponents of the new paradigm, they will improve it. Well, I think we have, you know, you know, even before we had that film, we had track evidence. We continue with, with <clears throat> examination of vocalizations, which cannot be attributed to cataloged, recognized North American mammals and birds, you know, dis dismissing wolves, coyotes, owls, loons, and even humans. I think we're and bringing in other evidence, us especially trace evidence, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll get to this in another in another presentation. <clears throat> the twisting of branches and saplings, the, this physical evidence of a mammal either acting out uh, an an element of uh, intimidation behavior or marking territory again something which we cannot yet attribute, which we can't attribute to another mammal, but, w w but which has been attributed, correctly or incorrectly, to the Sasquatch, and, and that warrants investigation. Explore its possibilities. Now, exploring its possibility is what gets us into trouble, because exploring the possibility that the Sasquatch is not merely a cultural phenomenon, not just a misidentified bear, not a hallucination, not a myth. In, in that narrow sense, <clears throat> we are saying, gee, th th there is this actual mammal out there leaving tracks, being observed, being filmed. And that leads, well, it, it, the implications or the possibilities, the, the very distinct possibility, is that existing prevailing knowledge will be to some extent overturned, possibly to quite a large extent. Uh, this is challenging prevailing knowledge and is acknowledged by many scientists as difficult. To show what it would be like to belong to the community guided by it. Well, unfortunately, people like me are not a good example of what it's like to be guided by this new paradigm because of the way I have been ignored by my scientific colleagues, by my sense of failure to attract uh, my scientific colleagues to examples of evidence supporting the new paradigm. On the plus side, there's this very large, very supportive amateur investigating community who very much appreciates uh, <clears throat> the participation of a scientist, you know, at, at the PhD level, and sadly, there at, currently, to my knowledge, there's only the two of us, uh, Professor Jeff Meldrum at Idaho State University and myself, but they do say things like, thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for coming to this Bigfoot conference, and um, telling us about your interpretations and your own research. Okay, so, so I mean, it's, it, it's good and bad, belonging to that community, and maybe that's the way it always is. <clears throat> and as that goes on, that being this, 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 uh, this process of bringing to the fore a new paradigm for consideration, as that goes on, if the paradigm is one destined to win its fight, 
and of course those of us with well, those of us who've been studying it for, you know, in my case, like some 50 years and intent, more intensely for the past 25 or so, feel it is very definitely destined to, to, to win its fight. Pardon, pardon me if that sounds arrogant, but there's a sense of conviction. If it's destined to win its fight, the number and strength of the persuasive arguments in its favor will increase. Well, thanks to the amateur investigating community, that is happening. There are many dedicated amateur investigators going out, I won't say every weekend, but somewhere in North America, every weekend, sometimes not just on weekends. And, and they, are, they are collecting evidence, they are documenting evidence, and, and, and this eventually will will come to the fore, even though it's very difficult to bring that evidence forward currently. More scientists will then be converted and the exploration of the new paradigm will go on. Well, well, this has been our, I won't say hope, this has been our expectation for many, well, several decades now, that scientists, even if not converted to the new paradigm would be considering it at, to the extent that they would be willing to explore the new paradigm. Uh, I'm on record in, in media interviews as saying, you know, we are not trying to prove the existence of the Sasquatch. We are trying to bring evidence forward so that our scientific colleagues will A, consider the new paradigm, which is the discovery claim, uh, B, scrutinize this evidence. Still more men and women, convinced of the new view's fruitfulness, will adopt the new mode of practicing normal science until at last a few elderly holdouts remain. This is Kuhn's final statement in this section, but let me just emphasize fruitfulness. Now, fruitfulness is, is a very pretty specific definition in scientists. When, when a hypothesis is raised, and this, of course, this paradigm is still at the stage of a hypothesis. It could be called a theory. Sometimes we're calling it a discovery claim. Fruitfulness is an attribute of a, of a paradigm in which the paradigm explains even more than originally intended. It doesn't just show that the Sasquatch is an existing track-leaving mammal. Part of its fruitfulness is that we, we now um, have reports of its, its elements of its behavior very accurately described. You know, the intimidation behavior of throwing stones, breaking branches, making loud noises, loud vocalizations, exuding a strong odor. Just, there's just a lot that's been reported and, and fits the paradigm. <clears throat> and that, that's, that behavior is in addition to the much more well-documented uh, anatomical features, you know, the, the long arms, which are very ape-like, the short, thick neck, which is very ape-like, the hunched posture, deep-set eyes, flat nose, uh, wide, thin, wide mouth, thin lips, uh, wide upper lip. It goes on. There is so much more. This is a very fruitful paradigm. Uh, one more word, yes, one, sorry, two words, will adopt the new mode of practicing normal science. Nor see, Kuhn's definition of normal science is, I think it's still pretty much accepted, that science progresses in a series of relatively small increments. You know, we that's how we are comfortable with science progressing. You start with prevailing knowledge, an accepted paradigm, and you add to it, you modify it a little bit at a time. It appears, <clears throat> in the case of the discovery of the Sasquatch, that we have made this leap suddenly from nothing resembling the Sasquatch in North America to suddenly maybe in 1967, it being filmed full-blown in Northern California, or suddenly, even just in 1958, its tracks appearing in Northern California. 
Ah, uh, and, and that's, that's something called uh, prematurity in, in, in scientific discovery. And prematurity is when a, a discovery claim is premature because there aren't all these links and steps leading up to what up to it in canonical or generally available knowledge. Well, as I took some pains to, <laughs> to document, uh, these steps, in fact, were in place. We just failed to recognize them. Without going all the way back into Aboriginal mythology, which is very, very helpful, very fruitful, um, there are the, the the historical accounts, published historical accounts of settlers and pioneers who described Sasquatches certainly in the mid 1800s into the late 1800s and then of course increasing not, uh, not just pioneers and settlers but recreationists, uh, prospectors, uh, <clears throat> outdoors people in general, trappers observing <clears throat> Sasquatches in the early 1900s. Some of these accounts being published, but, and we'll talk about this later, no one quite understanding these reports. We didn't yet have the idea of, a, of an upright primate other than a human here in North America. So, 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 so there were problem, problems. Anyway, I, I think normal science I think the discovery of the Sasquatch will eventually be seen to fit normal science until at last a few elderly holdouts remain. Well, sort of, I wish, I mean, I do encounter <laughs> elderly holdouts, people my age, and I'm very sympathetic. Yeah, I know it seems really bizarre, but what concerns me more is young scientists or young students in science who have I guess the word would be bought into prevailing knowledge of the Sasquatch as a hoax, a joke, and increasingly as a subject of entertainment. Now, I won't, I won't get going on uh, the Sasquatch or, or Bigfoot as a subject of entertainment at this point, but, but that's what has happened. And, you know, um, in being a subject of entertainment, there has some people have played rather fast and loose with with accuracy in, in depictions and representations of the evidence available and and I hate to say trivialized Sasquatch research, but it certainly appears to be that way. And you know, reality TV shows having become kind of the face of Sasquatch research to many North Americans. Some of us feel we may have been misrepresented. So it's not just elderly holdouts. But I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you very much.